Hey friends, welcome. Welcome again to Lou in his new, what is this, the second episode we're having in your new studio? That's right. My daughter's photography studio that I'm getting use of. It's Eye Candy Studios up here in Massachusetts. So It's called Eye Candy Studios? Eye Candy Studios, yep. Oh, nice. Nice name. <laughs> yeah, she's a, a bright, intelligent, and creative uh, woman now. She's 27, so I can't call her a girl. <laughs> <laughs> and she does, this is what, for like, just for podcasts or... No, she's a photographer. For so photography, she, that's she right. Has you a said studio that. set up for photography, and uh, yeah, she said, "Dad, come on, over. you can use my space." You know, she's not using nice. it all the time, and so setting nice. up and getting to do some work because I have the uh, Australian Shepherd at home who likes to bark a lot, so that's a bit oh, of a pain. Okay, okay. <laughs> so I had this to move out good. of the house. Yeah, that's great, friends. Um, we are going to be talking about uh, chapter eighteen, verses fifty-six, fifty-seven, fifty-eight, and fifty-nine today. Slowly, slowly, slowly creeping to the last few pages of the Gita. And I'm glad you uh, have been with me throughout these last 211 episodes. Um, hopefully, you'll be able to read it again and again, listen to it again and again, and get further and further in the benefits that this accrues to, your, to anybody's life. Yes. So verse 56 says, when you surrender, when you surrender, all your actions to me, when you surrender all your actions to me as you are performing them, by my grace, Krishna says, you will enter the eternal omnipresent abode. So as we've done before, what does, what does that mean? That as you surrender the actions to me as you are doing them, as you're performing them, means, first of all, Krishna tells, uh, we know from before that he has told us, you have to perform. You have to act every second of the day, unless you're fast asleep, deep sleep, dreaming. You can not act. But otherwise, you're acting every second that you're awake. Krishna says that your actions have to be done. You don't know what they're like. You do them whether they're good or bad. You will just do it. That's your prakriti that's doing it. With, that's our responsibility. You have to do them as much as possible to be selfless, and not thinking of yourself. But even if you do it with some amount of selfishness, you're still acting. And during this time, you are working for the Lord, for Ishwar, for God, as a sevak. A sevak is a uh, not a servant, uh, not a volunteer. He's, but let's say servant of God, a servant mm -hmm. of God, sevak. Yep. Take refuge, he says, in Lord, in the Lord, in Ishwara, attain enlightenment as you're doing this is essentially speaking to Arjuna who's a warrior who's a kshatriya who's fighting this this uh, righteous war if you remember the story in the Gita the Mahabharata these are bad people who have taken over the country bad people and he has to fight them because he's a warrior from mm -hmm. His, for generations, his grandfather, father, he, they all, all they did was enter the army and say, okay, we're going to fight to defend if needed. Now, he's a good warrior. He's fought many times in good, righteous wars. And now he's come not just to fight a war to take over somebody's kingdom so you can become rich, but, you know, when it's really needed. And Krishna had approached these people who he, Krishna, uh, Arjuna is fighting with, said, Please don't do this. Turn the kingdom back to the righteous, rightful owners. They mm -hmm. said, no, we're not going out. He, there was no choice but for Arjuna to fight. And he's a kshatriya. And Krishna says to him, you are a warrior. You're a kshatriya. That's your natural nature. Go and fight and defend your country and get it back to the rightful owners. In this verse, Brahman says that don't let your mind keep slipping from what you ought to be doing. So your mind, our mind, slips into chasing one materiality, money, security, artha and kama. Artha is security or wealth. Kama is your desires. Brahman says, don't, Krishna says, don't let your mind slip and chase sensuality. So artha, kama, desires for sensuality, security, money, etc. He says, don't let your mind slip into that. If you have a duty to do, you just do your duty as much as you can selflessly. Mm -hmm. Brahman says, how can you best do that? Is by surrendering your mind to Brahman 
as you're doing the action. While acting, eliminate ignorance by doing this. Study what we are talking about. Study spirituality. And once you do that, you will find that Brahman comes into your life and you become crystal clear. Brahman shines through everything as pure consciousness. That's really what Brahman is. Pure consciousness is life-sustaining. That's really what life is. Pure consciousness is life-sustaining. It's pure. It's brilliant. Mm -hmm. It's um, beautiful. But you and I are shading that Brahman and that pure consciousness, the beauty of that sunlight, so to say, with our ignorance. We, Because we don't know what we are talking about, we are blinded by our materialistic desires, our desires for artha and kama, for desires for money, for wealth, because we want security, or our sensual desires. And as a result, that ignorance, that negativity, jealousy, um, arrogance, uh, hatred, all of these negative qualities block your awareness of consciousness. And he's saying, get rid of it. How to get rid of it? While you're doing any action, keep your mind on me. In India, you see this a lot. You see that as a person is doing, I used to see it with my elders all the time, especially the women, as they're doing something, cooking or sweeping the floor or washing clothes or folding, they're humming a verse having to do with God. They're using God's name. They're combing some girl's hair and they're talking about not gossip, but they're saying God's name as they're combing the hair. So he's saying, whatever action you do, just like that example that we used in the previous episode, like a musician who's keeping his ear, one ear, onto the tune that's going on, the beat, and he's playing his thing, you, he says, while you're acting, whatever you're doing, keep your mind purely on me. And that helps your actions. And I've practiced that. As I practice it, whatever I drew, you know, as I'm getting excited about something, I say, no, this is for God. This is for God. This is for God. Uh, and, and that helps me a lot. You know, as I'm doing anything, if I'm enjoying something, I say, no, it's not for me. Don't enjoy it. It's for God. And that helps a lot. So just keep that in mind. Verse 57. Keep your mind constantly on me. We just said that while consciously surrendering all actions to me. We just said that. He's just re re repeating it. But he added here, regarding me as supreme and using discrimination and fix your mind on me. Similar things in a different <clears throat> words. So um, just like we said about the musician, keep your tune on him. Just like we said about the actor on a stage, the actor, while he's acting, knows who he is. And he is aware that this audience is in front of him. If he can see them through the darkness, he recognizes that there's a man right in the front. He's yawning, another woman next to him scratching her head. But he keeps acting and saying his lines. He's aware of that man who's yawning. He's aware of the woman who's scratching her head. He's aware of him acting and saying the lines. But he's also aware that he has a wife at home and he has a kid who's got a temperature. All of these things he's aware of but constantly throughout he's aware of who he is. So here he says, constantly be aware of me as Ishwar. Um, like we said in the previous episode, like a heat-seeking missile goes after an airplane or a rocket following the heat. He says, whatever you do, keep your mind constantly on Brahman. Whatever physical, mental, intellectual activity you're pursuing, keep your mind on Brahman. What does that mean? It means whatever activities you're doing, whether you're walking, whether you're lecturing, whether you're eating, um, just keep doing this. When you're meditating, when you're praying, do it full time, not just part time. Some people say, okay, I prayed in the morning when I wake up. Yeah. I pray in the evening before I go to sleep. And the rest of the time, I don't think about God at all. That doesn't work. You meditate, you pray, you should do it subconsciously, if not consciously, throughout the day. And that's basically what he's saying. Next verse, verse 58. By fixing your mind on me, I will help you to overcome all obstacles. By fixing your mind on me, as you're doing it, surrendering your actions, your mind, your thoughts, 
everything to me as you're doing your actions. I will help you to overcome all obstacles. And I tell you from personal experience, <clears throat> I can tell you that happens. Uh, I, when you're devoted, some higher force causes all ab obstacles to just melt away. Uh, try it. He goes on to say, however, if your ego prevents you from listening to my advice, you will perish in this quicksand of ordinary problems of your world. You will perish, he says, in this quicksand. Some people who don't know how to read this will say, what kind of a God <laughs> is this? If he's telling you, you will either listen to me or you're going to die. He's not telling you this to threaten you. He's not saying you better listen to me or else I'll kill you. He's not saying that. He's saying that this is a fact. It's a part of life. That if you continue to go in this way where you're just doing what you do for selfish reasons, there's a quicksand. He calls it quicksand. There's a quicksand that will pull you down. You know what quicksand is. Everybody does, right? Yes. Yep. It just keeps going down. You can't get out. You try to get out, but you're going further. The harder you struggle, the more deep you go. Nice example, metaphor in the Gita for this. So he's saying, if you just pursue your selfish needs, and you know this from your experiences, that the more money you have, the more power you have, the more things you have, the more you want. You're going to just go in this quicksand that goes down and down and down, and ultimately it, it is the death of you. So he's not saying, I'm going to kill you. He says, you will perish if you don't listen to me. But if you listen to me and you direct everything towards me, it'll be a different story. So he says, once you're in tune with me all the time, you're constantly thinking of me as a heat-seeking missile, what happens is the thought of Brahman goes into from your conscious mind to your subconscious mind, your unconscious mind, and deep into your unconscious mind. It goes in like almost like a carving, like a vritti, and it goes into your memory bank, and it also comes into the next life. All obstacles, he said, I help you cross over. And when you have that firmly embedded inside you through constant practice of thinking about Brahman all the time, about God all the time, then what happens? All obstacles get crossed over because there's a deep sense of some higher force being there for you. And that helps you in whatever ways I can explain it. But instead, if you identify with this ordinary prakriti, your body, your mind, your intellect, everything starts to go the other way. Right. What does that mean? It means that, you know, if I'm a body-oriented person, let's say I say, oh, look how beautiful I look. <laughs> I keep looking at myself in the mirror and I'm combing my long hair and I'm developing my muscles if I'm and, and uh, uh, washing my face and putting cream on it and makeup and all body oriented, I identify with the body, which means that whenever problems come up, people who identify with the body tend to have problems crop up that are more body oriented. Believe it or not, their problems seem to be my wrinkles on my face, the right. fact that my muscles are sagging, I've gained weight, all their problems because they're body oriented come to be body problems and they identify with their body. People who are identified with the mind, since the mind is all about emotions and, and uh, love and hatred and all of that, they seem to incur problems having to do with rejection and love and not enough love and uh, this one doesn't like me and he hates me, all having to do with emotion. People who identify with their intellect, their buddhi, have problems with intellectual thought, fame, power, position, and all their problems seem to be having to do with that. So Krishna says, you will perish in this quicksand of following these identifications with your body or mind or intellect. It's all a quicksand. You just keep going further and further down. Instead, he says, don't identify with the body, mind, intellect, uh, or any of that. Identify with me as Brahman, and I will help you overcome all these obstacles. What a wonderful thing that God himself says, you come with me. You All you do is devote everything, all your actions, all your thoughts, everything to me, and I take care of everything else. I will overcome all your obstacles. What a nice promise. Um, 
So he says, if you don't do that, then you will just perish in your quicksand. Not a threat is just a fact of life. Last verse, verse 59. Krishna says to Arjuna, if you say, I will not fight, if you as a kshatriya, a warrior, say, I will not fight, why? Because of your ego and your arrogance and say, I know better. These are my cousins. They may not be good. These are my uncles. They may not be righteous people. They've done the wrong thing, but mm, I know better. I, My ego, my arrogance says, mm -hmm. I should not fight. This determination of yours, Arjuna, is vain. And your inner nature will stop you. He's basically telling Krishna, as a kshatriya, as a warrior, you've got to fight. And if you don't, your inner nature will come back at some point to haunt you because mm -hmm. you didn't do it. Yep. It's a warning to all of us that if we have qualities which are more Brahman-like, intellectual, act as a Brahman. If you, a Brahmin, sorry, Brahmin-like, then act as a Brahmin. If your nature is that to be of a warrior, a kshatriya, then act as that. If your nature is to be a trader, bartering, doing business, then do that. And if you're just pure manual labor, then just do that. If you don't, if you try to do something different, it will come back to haunt you. He was saying to Arjuna, let's say you were to, as Arjuna said, I'm throwing down my bow and arrow and my sword. I'm not fighting. What Krishna says is a lot of things will happen. The nature of your being a warrior is not going to go away. You're still right. going to be internally a warrior. You think like a warrior. You react like a warrior. People are going to say, oh, you're a coward. You're a ninny. You're a, a sissy. You know, and what will happen is you'll get angry. And immediately you'll want to punch that guy. And then your warrior nature will come out. Except that on the battlefield, nobody's going to criticize you for fighting. But when you punch somebody in the face for calling you a sissy, that somebody will get you in trouble for. So he's saying your nature will come out one way or the other. So you better do it when you ought to do it instead of pushing it away because it'll come out in some other form. This determination of yours is vain and your inner nature will stop you. So from verse 59 to verse 66, Krishna urges Arjuna. We haven't come there yet. We're just starting it for the next uh, seven verses. He tells Arjuna to act according to his nature of being Kshatriya. He says, keep fighting so you can reach your um, ultimate abode. It is necessary, he says, for good men to defend righteousness. This is another example of what he's telling us. The righteous wars call for kshatriyas. We have seen in many of the wars that go on that when a righteous man, a warrior, is faced with an invader coming into his country hmm. and taking over, and bullying them and using unrighteous means to get them out or to destroy their country for no reason other than the fact that this bully, this larger country, wants to take over. He says, Krishna says, this is a time unlimited education. It applies to so many different. He says, the righteous war calls for kshatriyas. Arjuna's nature, his vasanas, his drive, his skills are to fight as a warrior. He says, when that case, you have to fight. By fighting, what happens is not just that, you know, people misunderstand this. So Krishna says, you've got to fight if you're a warrior and he will reward you. No, he, Brahman doesn't reward or punish. He says, you, by doing that, you're getting rid of your vasanas. You know, we're seeing this <clears throat> right now in the Ukraine. There are Americans who are getting bulletproof West, getting on planes and saying, I feel what they're doing in Ukraine, the Russians are is wrong. I'm getting on a plane. I'm going there. I'm going to fight. And as they do that, if they survive, then they say, you know, I feel so much better because I did this. So what Krishna says to Arjuna is by fighting, by doing what your nature is, you are going to get rid of your own vasanas. This is the important thing. That if you have a Brahminical vasana, then you are a Brahmin. You need to educate, you need to teach, you need to learn, you need to do Brahminical things. If you are a Kshatriya vasana, you need to fight. When it's a righteous war, when you think that there's fighting is needed, 
do what you need to do and you will be rewarded because your own vasanas will disappear and you will do the right thing and that karma will benefit you not that god is going to bless you and give you uh blessings if he doesn't fight as he says to krishna his vasanas will show up later and he'll use them at some other point and instead get into a bigger problem uh, so krishna says don't say i will not fight because it's vain uh, it's arrogant yeah. You think you know the right thing, but you're just going to mess it up for yourself because that desire to fight will come back at some later point. I think I've, I don't want to belabor the point anymore. <laughs> I've done it enough. It, it sounds like a, a, a modern. I was thinking of a modern principle of mental health as and, and attaching it to this, which is a lot of our struggle every day is attenuating our focus. And what it's telling us here is to attenuate our focus on higher ideals because as we do, our lower issues will drop off. You talk, we've talked about this several times through the era of these podcasts. As you raise the level of your vasanas, as you, uh, as you uh, focus on higher things, your lower needs drop off. Yes, yes. Yeah. That we've talked about that many, many times, and that's true. Uh, that as your level of uh, vision is goes higher, your desires for the lower fall off. Uh, and that's one thing he has said throughout the Gita that, you know, you keep looking, raising your ideal, raising your goals and your lower will fall off. That's one concept. What he's saying here is do what your nature tells you to do and then your other vasanas will drop off. But do it by dedicating those actions to me, not for you. So you've got a gun. You go to Ukraine to fight and you fight the Russians. And I'm not taking sides here. I don't want to, although I have my personal opinions. But when you're going to the Ukraine and you're fighting, keep Brahman, the Supreme, the Lord, uppermost in your mind as you're doing what you're doing. If you do that, then you say, I'm doing this because I believe this is a righteous war. I'm doing this for the right reasons. And I'm doing it for God because both sides might feel that they're doing it for the right reasons. And who, who is to determine who's right and who's wrong? People from one side say, oh, these people are right. People from the other side say, these people are right. Do what you think is right. Keep your mind on the supreme. Keep your mind on what you're doing. Not to say, ah, I got him. I'm happy. I'm glad. Not for selfish reasons. Not because it fulfills your vasanas, but to get rid of your vasanas. And that verse about perishing in the, in the quicksand it seems to me, as we've talked about it throughout the course of the podcast as well, is that if you focus, if you identify more closer with your lower needs and your lower desires, that's what you become. And you lose more and more attachment to Brahman. You lose your higher self more and more. And eventually the you, the actual you, which is Brahman, perishes and you're just stuck in this, stuck in all the earthly and lower level desires and problems. Right. If you, you know, uh, are constantly thinking about my body, you, some little scratch occurs somewhere to your body and you say, oh, look at that. It's going to leave a scar. You're so fixated on it. You tend to forget about the real you, which is the Brahman inside. There was just one thing that you said that I want to make sure that our listeners uh, realize that that's not how you meant. Uh, you said that Brahman perishes. I know you meant that in a more metaphorical yeah. sense rather than a literal sense, because Brahman never perishes. Right. Uh, but from a, a, from an other, your your knowledge of your Brahman, your right. awareness of Brahman, your connection to, to it, yes. your connection to it disappears. Yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. So thank you, friends. We just finished episode 211 probably what do you say i would say maybe four more episodes five more episodes lou probably two or three more weeks and then uh, then we have to decide what we're going to do you have to come up with a good name lou for you know, the next series of podcasts there are there are adventures ahead and we're going to keep yes. you all informed so we're finished with the gita but we're not finished no i'm very excited about what's coming up and I'm looking forward to it, too. We'll see you next time. Check us out Thank on you. Apple Podcasts, uh, Google Podcasts, Spotify, all the popular podcast outlets if you're looking at us on Facebook. There's Facebook as well. You can uh, email us at Gita Memoirs of a Psychiatrist at Gmail or uh, comment on one of the Facebook posts. See you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.